All right, so now we will get into return to play, current concepts and strategies. My time is cut in half, so I did get rid of all the videos, but if you guys have any questions on how to do any of the return to play tests, feel free to email me and I can definitely get you that information. The common goal of ACL reconstruction and rehab is to facilitate a return back to prior level of activity, and for many of our patients, this entails a return back to competitive sports. So how many actually return to play? A recent meta-analysis found 82% return to some level of sport in no specific time frame, 63% return to pre-injury sport, and 45 to 55% return to competitive sports. NFL studies confirmed uh, 62 to 63% return to sport, with, retra with return to play rates increasing by four to 12 times if drafted in the first four rounds, suggesting external motivational factors may play a role. Further high school and college football studies confirmed a 45% return to play rate with 38% returning at their prior level. Interesting enough, college football schools, specifically in the SEC, ACC, and Pac-12 report return to play rates to be substantially higher at 82%. Overall research suggests two-thirds of athletes may not, may not return to their pre-injury level of function despite being physically recovered, with some studies identifying fear as a negative personal, personal factor negatively affecting return to play. Of the athletes who return to play, how many re-injure? High school ACL re-injury rates were found to be about 30% for both males and females within two years of return to play. 35% for female athletes ages uh, 14 to 22 who return to basketball, volleyball, and soccer within five years. And 23% for all athletes under, any, under 25 years of age. Division one athletes demonstrated a 37% rate of re-tear, as well as rate of tear to the contralateral side. Return to any Division I sport increased risk of re-injury by 24%. Furthermore, recent literature concludes that 29 to 37% sustained a second ACL injury after return to play with contralateral ACL injuries occurring at similar rates as re-tears. So what are we using for return to play criteria to determine readiness? The good news is we have come a long ways in terms of ACL reconstructions. A recent meta-analysis conducted in 2014 found objective criteria consisting of 90% limb symmetry with the four, as well as with the four standard hop tests followed by quad and hamstring strength to be the most commonly used objective criteria six to nine months post ACL reconstruction. This is a huge jump in the right direction compared to systematic reviews from 2000 to 2011 that found only 13% used objective criteria, 40% gave no criteria, and 32% used time from surgery as their only criteria. So how is time dependent on return to play? Kingdom et al. found 100% of athletes who returned to sport in less than five months sustained an ACL re-injury. 39% re-injury rate when returning in less than nine months and declining down to a 19% re-injury rate when returning in nine months or longer. In fact, the re-injury rate was decreased by 51% for each month delayed up to nine months. We know time alone does not accurately identify impaired strength and neuromuscular control deficits. Therefore, we will move on to quad strength. Recent literature tracked ACL reconstructions over 24 months and found a 33% re-injury rate in those with a quadriceps limb symmetry index less than 90%. However, those who achieved a 90% or greater quadriceps limb symmetry index reduced their rate of re-injury down to only 12%. Limb symmetry indexes less than 90% have also been correlated with lower subjective IKDC scores, increased deficits with hop testing, and poor functional recovery at time of return to sport. How about hamstring strength? Tool et al. looked at 115 athletes and found that 81% of those whose hamstring strength achieved a 90% limb symmetry index in addition to their quad strength continued sport participation one year after return to sport. Furthermore, Hewitt et al. has documented multiple resources demonstrating initial and secondary injury risk with reduced hamstring strength and recruitment. Now we will get into the hop test. Results of hop tests have not been directly correlated with return to play. They have, however, been predictive of knee function as measured with post-operative self-reported questionnaires, such as the IKDC, which has in turn been found to correlate with odds of return to play. Of the four common hop tests examined, the six meter timed and crossover hop tests were the best predictors of normal subjective knee function. With a sensitivity of 88%, the crossover hop test most accurately identified those with normal function, likely due to it being the most functionally demanding. Furthermore, higher limb symmetry indexes with hop testing paired with normal IKDC scores together demonstrate the greatest odds of return, 
specifically being five times more likely to return to sports successfully up to seven times more if you <coughs> The single leg hop test for distance has been found to correlate with isokinetic extension peak torque and can be used as an additional recognition of muscle strength asymmetries. Commonly now you will see a 90% limb symmetry of the quad and hamstring strength paired with at least one hop test for return to play criteria, which overall has demonstrated a lower two-year re-injury rate. However, more strict return to play criteria requiring a 90% limb symmetry index with all four standard hop tests paired with 90% limb symmetry of quad and hamstring strength demonstrated a low 5% re-injury rate for those who passed, compared to a 38% re-injury rate with those who failed, which is a very significant finding. Furthermore, it's important to point out that this study consisted of 100 level one athletes in which only 14 were able to pass this criteria at six months, 55% therefore over half required 12 months to pass this criteria. Noting 35% were actually unable to achieve it. Similar to previous trends, it was documented that only 24% of these athletes actually passed before returning back to sport, which may be related to the 38% re-injury rate. Further research has found similar trends, noting 81% of non-elite athletes who met this strict criteria were able to return back to their pre-injury level of sport at 12 months, compared to 44% who failed that were able to get back to that pre-injury level. Tool et al. found uh, even more difficulty achieving combined return to sport criteria with 70 to 80% passing an individual hop test, 53% passing all hop tests, 43% achieving 90% limb symmetry with quad strength, 63% meeting 90% uh, limb symmetry with hamstring strength, 27 achieving 90% limb symmetry with quad and hamstring strength, and only 13% achieving 90% limb symmetry with quad and hamstring strength, as well as uh, all four standard hop tests. We can see it is difficult for even level one athletes to pass strict return to play criteria, however extended supervised therapy may help. Ebert et al. found of the 55% who returned, excuse me, of the 55% who attended supervised therapy for six months, nearly all achieved 90% limb symmetry for strength and hop tests by 12 months, compared to those who attended three months or less supervised therapy were unable to surpass more than about an 80, 85% limb symmetry with combined strength and hop tests. So longer supervised therapy definitely helped. Lastly, Critsis et al. Looked at, looked at this one step further and included passing a sport-specific agility test through a running T-test in addition to 90% limb symmetry with strength and hop testing and found those who met all criteria had a 10% retail rate compared to a 35% retail rate for those who did not meet all criteria. In addition to this, he found that lower quad to hamstring ratios were also associated with increased uh, risk of re-injury. So 90% limb symmetry with combined strength in the four standard hop tests is definitely a push in the right direction, as well as the, you know, the agility test, but it still does have its limitations, such as the risk of the, of the uninvolved limb deconditioning. We know post-ACL construction, both lower extremities have reduced proprioception and lower quad muscle activation, and that this population does tend to score lower than norms even bilaterally with hop testing. Wellstands et al. looked at 70 ACL reconstructions and found of the 57% who achieved 90% limb symmetry with quad strength and hop testing post-reconstruction, 34% did not meet pre-injury limb function, which was actually taken from the uninvolved pre-surgery. And of the eight who re-injured, six did not pass 90% estimated pre-injury capacity, which was more sensitive in predicting second ACL injuries than 90% limb symmetry indexes post-surgery. Obviously, a limitation of this is that knowing your athlete's pre-injury level or, or being able to test the uninvolved pre-surgery, which obviously can still be skewed uh, post-injury. In addition to these two, these two studies, I actually found another recent trial that uh, found that performance measures on the four standard hop tests using the uninvolved limb pre-operatively to be more superior again in predicting second ACL injuries than when compared to strength and hop tests six months or greater post-operatively. So it kind of makes you wonder if maybe we shouldn't try to test the uninvolved before surgery. What else leads to increased risk of injury? Well, we know that 50 to 60% of non-contact ACLs occur during landing from a jump with valgus alignment noted and that the athletes are two to four times more likely to have an ACL retear within one year if they demonstrate this alignment or increase in the extension moments with single leg landings. Furthermore, weak hip abductors 
extensors and external rotators predispose athletes to greater risk of primary and secondary ACL injury, as does deficits to single limb balance. And lastly, those who are at greater risk of re-injury post-ACL reconstruction were found to have altered neuromuscular control of the trunk with greater lateral trunk displacement noted bilaterally with cutting and pivoting, in which females have been identified to be at a greater risk. Therefore, per the research of Noyes et al., a drop jump visual or video assessment is a strong or is strongly encouraged to identify those athletes with at-risk mechanics prior to return to sport. Options exist with the test to be more objectively quantified by performing video analysis, which can then calculate either valgus or knee separation distance to compare to standard norms. Those athletes at greater risk can then be identified before return to play and the appropriate training can take place. We're able to do a video analysis in our clinic. Here we have an untrained athlete and you can see that knee separation distance is in the 30s to, to 40s here. So training definitely would benefit. Here we have an example of a, of a trained athlete and this was actually part of a return to play testing and uh, she did very well on the drop jump visual assessment. When it comes to identifying those with hip muscle dysfunction, performance on a single leg squat test correlates with hip isokinetic testing and greater valgus correlated with increased weakness and this test can predict frontal plane knee movement such as valgus with jumping and landing. We actually make them do five in a row on each side. Uh, the hands do have to be locked in the hips if they can perform without loss of balance. Here you can see examples of good and then we do have examples of hip drop, trunk lean, and valgus and this athlete was unable to maintain the appropriate balance with the hands on the hips. Here we have an example. Uh, yep, already went through that. Next up would be the modified star sturgeon balance test, which the Cincinnati Medical Center highly recommends to include with functional testing for return to sport following any lower extremity injury. Reporting those with composite mean reach distances less than 94% limb length, more than six times likely to sustain a lower extremity injury. This test requires strength, flexibility, proprioception, dynamic posture control, which again was noted to be impaired post ACL reconstruction. The literature is suggesting normal side to side asymmetries range from 3 to 8%, which can serve as a basis when using as part of this return to play decision making. With our ACLs, we want the anterior reach distance to be less than 4 centimeters. That's related with reduced risk of re injury. And uh, limb length, uh, that limb length comparison is pretty important as well. According to Noise et al, a pre planned side cut assessment should be considered as part of return to play criteria to identify those, especially females with high risk technique, who may benefit from training to improve this skill. Again, you're watching for posture control, stable trunk, valgus, reduced knee and hip flexion, and uh, trunk leaning. And furthermore, as mentioned, uh, a significantly lower re injury rate was noted when return to play criteria incorporated an agility test, specifically the T test. This test requires the athlete to move, change direction, and position the body quickly and efficiently while under control. The normative data in the previous study that found the reduced risk of re-injury had 11 seconds as a cutoff, and this was actually uh, for males and females, and when you look up the normative data for that, that puts you at a good rating for females and average for males. And again, if you have any questions on how to perform these, I can get you that. There are other agility tests available that can be completed in a variety of clinical settings and space, which do have documented norms. I'm also a, a big fan of the lower extremity functional test by George Davies, and he does have normative data for it. Furthermore, taking this one step further, there are sport-specific tests incorporating the unpredictable nature and reaction-based demands of sports, which can further determine return to sports um, readiness by how the athlete moves and responds. You can look these up. Functional testing, including hop tests, objectively show functional deficits between lower extremities and should be included in the return to sport decision making process. They are not 100% perfect, but the literature has actually demonstrated that no single test is at this point. In fact, this slide demonstrates just how uncorrelated return to play tests can be, and thus justifies using the battery of tests reviewed in this presentation for return to play decision making. In our clinic, we'll actually do a combination of about six return to play tests. Exact benchmarks for return to play criteria is unknown, but objective testing works and is getting us in the right direction. So in review, patients should achieve a 90% limb symmetry index with the quad and hamstring, 90% limb symmetry with two to four hop tests with controlled landings, your subjective rating is also very important with that, a drop jump assessment with proper landing mechanics, 
Single leg squat test with a good subjective rating. 92% or greater limb symmetry with a modified star excursion balance test or a composite mean score within 94% limb length. Proper cutting mechanics with a 45 degree side cut. Passing of an agility drill with proper form and technique and then always get position clearance. As you can see, a number of these tests do not require special equipment and can be completed in many clinical settings. Another point I wanted to bring up is when your patient is receives position clearance and has passed or returned to sport criteria. A lot of times, they're sometimes just told they're, they're good to go, and this can kind of be overwhelming for the athlete. So what we have found that works pretty well is to give them some guidance, work them into controlled drills at practice, then go ahead and allow them to participate in 50% of non-contact practice, work into full contact practice, furthermore work them into 50% of contact practice before full contact practice, and then work them into friendly games and scrimmages have reduced time with this, gradually bump up the time, and then work them into a game scenario. Again, reduce time, gradually increasing the time. And that is it.